team, man. Y'all know I love worship. Man, I love to worship and I can't sing, so I have the utmost appreciation and respect for the worship team, man. Thank you, Tillman. Thank you, Elena. So, I am very, very excited to kick off this series tonight, Matthew's Greatest Hits. And when Tom asked me if I'd be willing to come up here and talk, um, man, I knew exactly where I wanted to go. Um, two reasons. One is because Tom and I, we talk a good bit, I'd say, and, you know, we're pretty good buds. And uh, we were talking about you guys, and because you guys are near and dear to our hearts. And Tom was saying that a lot of you guys are, or whether, whether verbally or just in your heart, you're just kind of saying, all right. I'm picking up what you're putting down on Sundays, I, I'm listening, I'm there, but, but, but where is Jesus? How do I find this guy? How do I get what y'all have, you know, other leaders? How, how do I have this Jesus? How do I meet him? Where is he at? Right? And the really cool thing is that if you were to read the New Testament in, in, in book order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all the way to the end, it'd only take you about five chapters. Five chapters before Jesus is like, oh, by the way, here's where I am. Here's who's going to find me. Here's the types of people that I'm looking for. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Matthew chapter 5. That's where we're going to camp out tonight. And, and Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 5 is, is given this thing. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Woo! Right? And so if you were to, if, you, if your Bible's in red, you got that red ink for Jesus talking, 5, 6, and 7 is pretty much all red. Right? Because all he's doing is he's giving this sermon. He's laying out what does this thing called life look like. You know why he can lay out what it looks like? Because he designed it, right? So he lays out for us exactly what it looks like, and he opens it. His big opener, icebreaker intro is these things called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes is is what Elena just read, okay? It's, It's basically, where are you going to find Jesus? What are the types of people that Jesus is going after, Right, and what's so cool is, is I've been a Christian for about four and a half years now, a follower of Jesus, and, and I've been involved in some sort of fashion in ministry for three and a half of those four and a half years, and I've seen people come to know Jesus, I've seen the light bulb go off, I've seen their hearts illuminated, I've seen their lives go 180, I've seen it all, man, it's so cool, and what it always seems to come back to is this first beatitude. So I'm so glad that we read them all tonight because I want you to hear them all. But, but the first one is just the one that I always see in action. I always see playing out. I always see these people coming to Jesus. And so it says this, starting in verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a distinction I want us to notice, okay? So if you read all the Beatitudes, which you should do, I'm just not going to do it right now, but if you read them all, you'll notice there's a difference in two of them. Jesus' bookends, which means the first one and the last one, are different than the ones in the middle. All the ones in the middle, they say, you will be, will be. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It might be in the next five seconds, might be in the next five minutes, might be in the next five years. Okay, it's on God's timing. Or, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. As one version says, for their thirst will be quenched. I like that. I like that a lot. Right? So their thirst will be. But the first one and the last one, it's got a different word in there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is trying to make this distinction for us that, hey, you want the kingdom now? You want what Jesus offers now? Not, not when you go home and pray. Not when you live 80 years of a faithful, righteous life. Not when you read the Bible for X amount of minutes per, per week or, or go to X amount of church services per year. Not any of that. You want it right now in your chair. Where you sit, be poor in spirit. Be poor in spirit. Right now, now it's not necessarily easy. I, I don't want to say it's easy to find Jesus because that means if you haven't found him, it's your fault. But, but it's also not a secret. He lays it out for us right there. There's where I am. You want to find me? Be poor in spirit. And so what does that mean? Right? We answered where he's at. What does that mean? Well, um, first you need to make sort of a, a, a clarity here. Everybody on earth, if you look around the room, if you look around the city, you look around the country, the world, everybody is poor in spirit. 
Everybody is lacking an ulterior source of power, okay? Everybody is, is their, their spiritual tank is empty, and they need someone greater. So, so is everybody going to experience the kingdom of heaven? Well, not exactly. So I had this, this friend in college, still a good friend of mine, but he was, he was, he was in our friend group, and um, just his life situation was that he, he uh, was always worried about money. And not like worried about money like he was super greedy, but he had a genuine uh, concern for his bank account. I mean, we would literally say, hey, buddy, let's, let's go to, we're all going to go to cookout. You want to come? And he'd say, oh, let, me, let me check my checkings, right? Let me switch over some from the savings. Like he was really that kind of on the line. But the problem wasn't that he necessarily didn't have as much money. The problem was he would never let us help him out. Like, we love this guy. We wanted him to come with us. We'd say, hey, we're going to cookout. He'd say, I, I probably can't do it tonight. Hey, so we got you. We can buy your cookout. Or we say, hey, man, we're going bowling. We want you to come. Come bowling. I, I probably can't do that. Hey, we'll, we'll pay for you. Just come on. Like, we want you to come with us. But he would never accept it. The whole four years we were there. Never once let us pick him up. And so it wasn't necessarily the fact that he didn't have the money. It's that he wouldn't acknowledge the fact that, hey, I, yeah, you know what? I'd love some help. I could use some help. Right? Another way that we see this kind of laid out for us is, is that Jesus um, is talking to these Pharisees. If you flip over to, to Matthew chapter 9, which I've got a bookmark because I'm so prepared. So Matthew, in, I mean, sorry, Jesus in chapter 9 has just called this disciple named Matthew, the writer of this book, right? And Matthew was a tax collector, and I don't have time to get in the history of that, but let's just say if you Google greedy, a first century tax collector is going to pop up. Okay, just the greediest of the greedy. And this is who Jesus says, hey, I want you to follow me. Right? And then when he follows him, he says, we're going to have a party, and it's going to be at your house. Right? And I want you to invite all your friends, all your peers, all those that are hated by the rest of society. They're going to be there, and we're going to have a party. Right? So that's where we pick up in verse 10 of Matthew chapter 9. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, notice they asked his disciples, but Jesus doesn't need a spokesperson. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Now Jesus is so cool that actually when I did fourth and fifth grade this morning, we talked about this same story, but in Luke. And I read kind of from their little children's Bible so that we were all on the same page. And, and what their children's Bible says is, I have not come to call those who consider themselves righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. So you want to find Jesus, don't consider yourself righteous. Don't consider yourself okay. You got to be in desperate need. This was beautifully illustrated to me uh, not that long ago. I got to go to Israel. It was a crazy cool blessing that I got to do that at, at my age, and I hope to go again. I, I would encourage everybody in here to go whenever you have the chance, even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't care about this junk, you should go. It's a pretty cool country. It's a pretty cool land, pretty cool history, right? But I got to go to Israel, and, and we did a lot of things, a lot of different things, some Christian, some not necessarily Christian, but still Israel-related and uh, there's two pictures in particular that I want us to look at. The first one, if you can throw that up there, Tanner, is this building right here. Doesn't look like much. Uh, it's all cement. It's abandoned for many years, as you can tell by the tree growing out of the roof. Uh, there's graffiti all over it, on the inside especially. Um, not very, doesn't look like very much. Now, if you throw up the second picture, Tanner... These are some ruins. If you can tell, it's kind of standing outside. There's ruins, a little, little circle in the middle from the Byzantine Empire in the 4th century. All right, so these two pictures don't, mean like, don't look like they mean very much, but these two pictures have absolutely changed the way that I view my walk with Jesus. They've actually absolutely changed the way I view helping others, and they've absolutely changed my life. And so if you go back to the first one, Tanner, I want to talk about it real quick. So this is a building... You can actually Google it. It's called the Syrian Military Headquarters. Syrian Military Headquarters. Now, I was able to go because over time, you can tell this building hasn't been used in a long time. So over time, the, the, border, the, ter the border actually changed so that this building is now in Israeli territory. Um, so we were able to go. 
But we went up there to the top, and, and we had this Israeli, former Israeli general talk to us. And it was so cool. He took us to the top of the building, and uh, it was like 40 degrees, which is fine, but it had a wind chill of like 10. It was nuts. Okay, so we were up there trying to pay attention to what he's saying, and I'm so glad that we did. But what he did was he pointed at these ruins that were not from, not from where I'm standing to the main building, not that far. And he pointed at them, and it, it looked kind of like that, but it was definitely like the building was torn down. It had been bombed, and you could tell there was a building once there, but definitely not anymore. And he said, you guys see that former building? And we said, yeah. And he said, that's Syria. So we were not from where I'm standing to the main building to another country. Now, that might not be that cool for you. It was pretty cool for me. But, but Syria and Israel, the Syrian people and the Israelite people have had conflict going back far longer than Jesus. Like long, thousands and thousands of years, these two people have had conflict. But the, the current modern-day Syrians and the Israeli people have had conflict going back to 1948. Okay? Now, I've got to give a little bit of history, so stick with me. It's all going to come into play at the end. But, but 1948, if you don't know why that's significant, that was the, the, day, the year that, that the Israeli people were given their own nation by the European Union, and Israel was established as its own state. Okay? But there's a lot of Arab countries right around Israel that don't consider it a real state. Our guide told us that, that they consider it basically Narnia. <laughs> Like it's make-believe. Like it's this cute little thing that the European Union did for these people that sort of appeased them and they gave them this country and whatever. But it's not a real recognized nation state. And so if you had an Israeli passport and you wanted to go to a neighboring Arab country, which I'm not exactly sure why you would, but let's say you wanted to go there, they wouldn't let you. They wouldn't recognize your passport as a real government document because your government's not a real government (laughs) because you're not in a real nation. Right? But, it, but it goes even deeper than that. See, since 1948, Syria and, Isra- and Israel have had military conflict, political conflict, societal conflict, cultural conflict. It's never really stopped. Right? But something changed about a decade ago. It's about pretty much 11 years ago. And what happened was Syria fell into a civil war. Now, it's not a civil war like, like the American Civil War with an established north and established south trying to fight each other. Now, this, this civil war is terrorist groups versus government versus people. And the terrorist groups don't like the government or the people. Government doesn't like the terrorist groups or the people, and the people don't like the terrorist groups or the government. And when I say people, I just mean everyday citizens trying to mind their own business, live in a good country, keep their household safe, right? Just everyday people. And so the civil war got real nasty. It is real nasty, Because you're dealing with terrorists, right? And so the people would be in the middle of the crossfire all the time. And what would happen is they would end up with wounds, gunshot wounds, bomb wounds. They'd get ill, as people do. But but the problem was there was no established government, and the government that was technically established didn't like the people. So there was no good health care. There was no good education. There's no nothing good provided by a government that we probably take for granted. But they didn't have any of it. And so they, they eventually became so desperate that they would walk towards the Israeli gate, the gate that separated uh, Syria from Israel, and they would just stand there. Now, you don't understand. When we were on top of this building, and he pointed at those ruins, he said, that, he said, you see those ruins? That's Syria. He said he asked his friend from Syria, why don't you guys clean that up? Why doesn't your government come through, clean that up, get rid of it? It's not, a, it's not a pretty part of history. Why do you guys just leave it there? And I said that the government leaves it there because they'll take elementary school children and they'll walk them through different ruins like that, different buildings that have been bombed in war, and they'll say, this is what the Israeli people do. They bomb our buildings, they kill our people, they're horrible, they're awful, they're the worst, and we hate them. So they implant that into the minds of children for generations and generations. So this is thousands of years of conflict, but generations of hate. But they became so desperate, these people, these citizens of Syria, that they would just walk to the gate and just stand there. They didn't really know why they were doing it, but they figured, I can't have any help here. Let me just figure out, maybe from this other country, can I get some help? And so what eventually happened was Israeli soldiers would would walk out and try to figure out what they're doing. So they'd walk out there with their guns, and they'd question them, and as you do with an enemy, right? And then they figured out these are just normal, everyday citizens that just want help. 
And so they'd bring them in, and, and, and they'd take them to hospitals, and they'd, they'd see real doctors and get real help and get their wounds bandaged and, and get their illnesses medicated, and then, and then they'd go back to Syria. And they'd start to tell their, their neighbors and their friends, they'd say, hey, I don't know why we, you know, I know what we've been told all our lives. I know what we've been told about these people. But if you're in need, just go stand at the gate. Just go stand at the gate, and somebody's going to come out and take you to a real doctor. They have real doctors in there. They'll take care of you. And so to this very day, like to this very day, Syrian citizens will walk to the gate of Israel and they will just wait in the hope that an Israeli soldier will walk out, take them into their country, see a good doctor, get good medication, and, and be healed. Right? But the only ones that are, that are going to these great links, that, that are risking everything they've ever known, everything they've ever been taught, everything they thought about the world, is because they're in desperate need of help. And then just days before we went to this building, we went to these ruins. If you pull those up, Tanner. Um, so I told you these are 4th century Byzantine ruins, okay? Now that's not the cool part. See, this is a former church from the Byzantine Empire. If you don't know what I'm talking about, in Jesus' day, uh, his area was ruled by the Roman Empire, well, give it a couple hundred years, they're now ruled by the Byzantine Empire, okay? But this is in Capernaum, and Capernaum became known as the, uh, the missionary headquarters of Jesus. So he was from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, but he headquartered his ministry in a city called Capernaum, right? So we got to visit Capernaum, and we got to see these ruins, and, and, and like I said, this is a church from the 4th century Byzantine Empire, but that's also not the cool part. What the cool part is, is that underneath these ruins, the foundation that these ruins were built on is the house of Simon Peter. So I got to stand that close to the former house of Simon Peter. Now I didn't know, I don't know if you know this about my King Jesus, the one that I dedicate my life to, the one that I, I do everything according to the way that he's asked me to do it, but, but my King Jesus was homeless. My King Jesus was homeless. And so what he would do was he would stay with people that he trusted people that were willing to take him in. And, it, and it's not unlikely that if this is his missionary headquarters and he's got a disciple named Simon who's got a nice house, it's not unlikely that Jesus would have stayed there very often. And so I got to stand that close to the place where Jesus would often lay his head. But that wasn't really what shook me. What shook me was the Bible talks about when Jesus would go places, crowds would follow him. If he ever got off a boat, there would be a crowd ready for him. If he ever entered the city gate, there would be a crowd waiting for him. And, and, and Scripture talks about what people would just wait around just to get a glimpse of this guy named Jesus. That they would stand outside Simon Peter's house and just hope maybe if Jesus came out of the house, they could see him. They had heard that he's this great healer, this great physician, right? This great, this great uh, messiah, and so they would say, maybe if this is true, and, and he walks out of the house to go to the, the market or just to go to a different house or the Sea of Galilee, maybe I'll just get a glimpse of him. And maybe if I get a glimpse of him, maybe I can talk to him. And, and, and just maybe if I can talk to him, I can tell him what's wrong. And if I tell him what's wrong, just maybe, just maybe, he'll heal me. But what we learned from Matthew chapter 9 at his dinner is, is that not everybody was that interested in this Jesus. Because there's these guys named the Pharisees, and, and, and they were it, right? They were the guys of the day. They were the religious leaders. They had the Old Testament memorized, memorized, right? And so they didn't understand this need, but there were people in the town who did. And they were the greediest of the greedy, the nastiest of the nasty, the sick of the sick, the ones in need, and so as I look around the room tonight, I, I don't like making generalizations, but I think there's three groups of people. There's one group that says, hey, Caleb, I hear you, man, and, and i got to be honest with you. If Jesus doesn't show up right now, I don't think I'll make it through the night. Like, I'm in such desperate need of some sort of help, and at this point, I'll, I'll go to anything. And if this guy named Jesus is truly who you say he is, then fine, I'll give him a shot. Right, I think that's group one. I think group two would say, hey, listen, I show up, 
I hear you, you're passionate about this. I know that you and Tom and these leaders, you know, you guys really are passionate about this, but I'm all right. I'm good. You know, I come because my parents tell me to, and, you know, we're, we're good people, and so I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. All right, and then I think there's a third group who, who would honestly just say, hey, I, I don't like any of this. I don't like you. I don't like these people. I don't want to be here. My parents make me be here. I'm not interested in Jesus. And what might surprise you is that the group that I'm actually the most worried about, the group that probably will keep me up at night, is not the first group, and it's even not the third group. It's the second group. It's the second group. And I, and I often jokingly say in conversation, if, if you ever have a conversation with me, is, is I hate it when people say that I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. I hate it when people say that. Right? And I always say it in a lighthearted way, and, and my response to it is usually like, nobody's ever said they're fine and meant it, which I, I, I do partially believe. But the real reason is that I hate that word is because being fine leads you nowhere. Being fine will lead you nowhere. See, the, the people in the first group, you're actually right there. Jesus is right there. I just want you to, I just beg you to hold out your hands. I don't know if metaphorically or literally, but just hold out your hands. He's right there. And you tell him, you tell him, you say, I, I, if you don't show up, I'm not going to make it through tonight. You know what he'll say? He'll say, I know. And I love you. And 2,000 years ago, I died so that I could meet you today. That I could meet you right now tonight. I know you walked in this room not thinking anything was going to happen. It's going to be any other Sunday. But I, I truly believe the reason I come every Sunday night, I don't know if you guys ever think about this, and I'm not going to speak for the leaders, but I don't think they disagree. But the reason that I come every Sunday night is because I truly believe that I could walk in here and see somebody's life be absolutely changed. And so when they walk out the door, not when they go home, but by the time they walk out that door, their life is completely different. I honestly believe it every Sunday. And so I'm not incredibly worried about that first group. I'm also not incredibly worried about that third group, surprisingly enough, because I've seen too many people, too many mentors in my life have that same sort of view. So I don't care about that nut job stuff and your Christian crutch religion and, you know, I, I'm not even interested. I don't even like it. But, but go read about Saul in the Bible. Ask my uncle. What happened to him? See, Saul got kicked off his horse, and I don't mean kicked, but he got thrown off of, of his horse or his camel or whatever by Jesus. By Jesus. And if you read it, Jesus had long been back up in heaven, but, but he came back to kick Saul off his horse and say, you're going to follow me. So, so I'm not necessarily even worried about that third group, but that second group terrifies me because you know what you probably are fine you're probably getting along just fine and you might even think that bringing Jesus in your life would complicate things but there's going to come a day and, and I fear it for you but there's going to come a day where you're going to say I need something more I need something else whatever I've been filling my life with ain't it and I hope that it doesn't take you as deep down in the pit as I had to go or as I've seen other people go. I hope it doesn't take a spiral of your life, but I hope one day Jesus just shows up and says, you are not fine. You need help. You need help. And so when we go to breakout rooms, breakout groups tonight, they're going to ask, which group are you in? Man, I encourage you, it's not about what group your neighbor's in. It's not about what group you think the leader wants you to be in. Because you lying to the group and to the leader ain't going to help anybody. It doesn't help us. certainly doesn't help your classmates. But you being honest with everybody, including yourself, that brings life. That brings life. And I truly believe that there's one person, at least one, who's going to walk out of that door completely different because they know I'm poor in spirit. I'm poor in spirit. I need help. And to whoever, whoever you are, brother and sister, it's Jesus, and he's right there. Just open your hands. He's right there. Pray with me, guys.
Jesus, we are so desperate for you, so poor in our hearts and our spirit, Lord. Christian, devoted follower to, to the most I'm good, fine person in here, we are so poor and in need of you coming in and filling up our cup, filling up our heart. Jesus, I pray that every single day we're like the Syrian people. Jesus, that show up at the gate and say, I don't really know what's happening, but I need help. And I've heard that y'all help us. I've heard that you'll take care of me. Is that true? Jesus, I pray that you continue to be like those Israeli soldiers that bring them in, take them to the hospital. Jesus, I I pray that our hearts continue to be like the people in Capernaum who would sit outside of Simon Peter's house and just say, if Jesus will just walk out of there, maybe I can get a glimpse of this Messiah. Maybe I can get a glimpse of this healer. Maybe, just maybe, my life can be different today. But the only reason I'm standing here is because I am in need of help. Jesus, pray for every single student and leader in here, Lord, that, that you would... Show us our need for you, and, and Lord, if, pray that you don't have to go to the links that you had to go with me of just breaking me and breaking me and breaking me. Dare I say hitting rock bottom, but Lord Jesus, if that's what it takes, then your will be done in each and every heart in this room. Lord, if you can save somebody from that, if you can give them a boring testimony, Jesus, I pray that tonight. You are the king. You are our king, you are my king, you reign supreme. I love you, and it's your beautiful name I pray, amen. Stand and worship with us, guys.